So uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, the ecological relationship between ants and beetles and how this sheds light on a quite enduring uh, evolutionary biology question, which is how predictable biological evolution is. You probably all know Stephen Jay Gould argued for a role of contingency in phenotypic evolution. He stated that any replay of the paper life so much stochasticity in natural selection in terms of mutation and environmental variation. Well, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Much better. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, <laughs> that means all of this uh, stochasticity means that phenotypic evolution is inherently an unpredictable process. Now, obviously, counter to Gould's view, are many cases of evolutionary convergence, most famously these adaptive radiations, where you get very similar phenotypes evolving in independent lineages under parallel <coughs> selective regimes. And these famous examples like Darwin's finches, African lace cichlids, and three-spined sticklebacks seem to argue against Gould's kind of uh, uh, point of view. But you could counter this by saying that these uh, adaptive radiations are evolutionary, evolutionary very young tens of thousands to only a couple of million uh, years in age, often involved in just the same genus or even the same species. And so the similarity in the genome, the developmental program, and the ecology of these independent lineages makes it kind of unsurprising that they may respond similarly under comparable selection, selective regimes. And sure enough, with increasing phylogenetic separation of taxa, instances of convergence that we know in the literature start to drop off dramatically. So as you start going beyond a few million years in age, the phylogenetic distance between taxa reduces the likelihood of convergence evolving. So this would seem to support Gould's view for contingency in the evolutionary process. Now, what I'm going to discuss today with you is some work I've been doing uh, uh, on road beetles, at which uh, provides an example of deep time uh, convergent evolution of a really complex phenotype, which uh, 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 again, opposes Gould's point of view for contingency in the evolutionary process. Now, road beetles are the largest metazoan family. There's 61,000 species of them. And scattered across this gigantic group are many lineages which have a really remarkable uh, ecology where they live as symbionts inside colonies of social insects. And this is an example of one of these species here, actually from Austin, Texas, that I collected the day after I got married. And you can see it's a remarkable, has a remarkable biology where it's socially integrated into this colony of ants and is accepted by them as ventrophylactically. Normally ants are extremely aggressive to intruder arthropods. This species has bypassed the nest mate recognition system and inserted itself into the colony, colony life. And this way of life is social par socially parasitic way of life is called myrmecophily, and it's arisen multiple times across the arthropod tree of life. And there's examples of uh, myrmecophilus crickets. Myrmecophilus uh, butterfly caterpillars, like Naomi talked about yesterday. And Myrmecophilus is really a paradigm of complex symb symbiosis between behaviorally uh, uh, elaborate organisms. And it evolves uh, uh, in, in more than a number of times in road beetles. There's more Myrmecophilus road beetles than maybe all other Myrmecophilus lineages in the arthropoda put together. And most dramatically, some of these myrmecophiles that live inside colonies of aggressive army ants. So if you've ever gone for a stroll in the tropics and encountered army ants, you'll have seen a swarm of nomadic ants uh, uh, moving across the forest floor. They're predatory species, they other other arthropods. But if you watch one in emigration or uh, raiding trails very closely, what you'll notice is maybe one in every 5,000 to one in every 10,000 of these ants is actually a beetle. And these are some examples of them here. They have a so-called myrmecoid body plan, this ant-mimicking body plan, and they walk in file with the moving army ants. And they don't just mimic the ants, they're also socially integrated into these colonies and accepted by their hosts. It's really radical uh, uh, phenotypic evolution. Now, uh, all of these uh, myrmecoid uh, road beetles belong to one subfamily of the Thacolinae bee called Aliocoridae. This is the largest subfamily of animals, 16,000 species. And they have a very generalized road beetle morphology like this. And so from this kind of ancestral uh, and boring morphology, this myrmecoid body plan has arisen with all these elaborate uh, 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 
of mythological innovations. And there's been a controversy as to whether there's a single origin of this move towards body plan or multiple independent origins of it. So to shed light on this uh, uh, evolution of this uh, kind of biology, in collaboration with Munatoshi Maruyama at Kyushu University, we spent a lot of time collecting these uh, myrmecoid growth fields from colonies of army ants throughout the world's tropics with every single uh, described known genus of, of army ants. Quite a painful, painful, uh, <laughs> painful project. And uh, uh, sequenced them along with a bunch of free living generalized growth fields from across the arthropod biology. And this is the result. It's really striking polyphyletic origin of this myrmecoid body plan. We calculated there's a minimum of 12 independent uh, evolutionary origins of this uh, morphology across the arthropod uh, uh, phylogeny. So this is really striking extreme morphological convergence that you see in this clade of beetles. And each one of these clades is associated with a single army ant genus. So in contrast to the monophyletic army ants, these three beetles are polyphyletically associated with each individual one of these army ants, and evolution has walked down a very predictable phenotypic evolutionary trajectory from the generalized free living body plan to the socially integrated myrmecoid and mimicking body plan. So here's just some examples to show this really striking morphological convergence. This is, this is a new world genus and an old world genus, totally unrelated, but again, strikingly similar to each other, associated with different army ant genera. Here's another pair of examples. Really amazing morphology on, on this thing. And it's not just that they're morphologically convergent, they're behaviorally convergent too, because they of the set of behaviors which socially integrates them into colonies of these aggressive army ants. So you find them grooming the army ants, they'll nest in the temporary bivouacs of these species to follow them on raiding and emigration uh, uh, marches, and they're accepted by the ants. So it's a whole morphological and behavioral complex syndrome that's evolved in these beetles. If we calibrate the evolution of this, the, the Alioclai and we plot the origins of these uh, myrmecoid clades, you can see a really striking pattern where they all arose during the last 50 million years or so, during the Cenozoic, which is kind of when we think that ants became, started to become really ecologically dominant, including probably army ants too. What's really striking is that all of these clades share a common ancestor as far back as 105 million years ago in the early Cretaceous. So here we have an example of really deep time scale morphological uh, convergence happening repeatedly across a large clade of organisms. So this really runs counter to Gould's view of the contingency of evolution of the deep evolutionary timescale. It's very predictable what happens when these beetles uh, evolve to live with, with army ants. You have to wonder how they are so good at doing this, integrating into these aggressive army ant societies. Well, we think that alioclines are pre-adapted to life inside ant colonies for three reasons. First of all, they're predatory, so they desire the nest resources available to them inside ant colonies, things like the food, the workers themselves. Secondly, they're chemically defended so they can walk into ant colonies and protect themselves. They have defensive gland at the tip of the abdomen that pumps out defensive compounds like quinones, top topical irritants. If you see one of these alioclines interact with an ant, this is a free living species that I keep in the lab, it just bend its abdomen over and blast the ant in the face and that enables it to escape. So this is a real good pre-adaptation ecological coexistence with ants. It also enables these beetles to specialize inside ant colonies because they reap certain obligate myrmecophiles that reprogram the chemistry in the gland from defensive irritants to compounds that behaviorally ma manipulate the host ants. So things like Pella pump out sulfitone instead, which is ant alarm pheromone, causes the ants to disperse and enables a much more effective response from the uh, uh, means of maintaining a presence in the nest. Other species, for example, Lomacusa, have evolved new glands which produce appeasement compounds to seduce the ant into accepting them into the nest and even feeding them out of the mouth pro prophylactically. Thirdly, the uh, body plan of Alioclines is very uh, pre-adapted for living in army ant colonies. They have these short wing cases and an exposed abdomen, and that enables them to evolve this ant-like morphology relatively easily. And we think that the ant-like form forms a, 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 a function in tactile mimicry inside army ant societies. Army ants are essentially blind. They, Tactile cues are probably very important in this area, so these beetles have to, uh, 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 to gain social integration. Their body plan has to assume this ant like shape, and they're able to do this because they have this fle flexible uh, morphology. 
So what this means is this clay down the alkaline is really a kind of paradigm for exploring the evolution of this complex type of symbiosis from a free living ancestral condition. It's trying to get at the mechanisms that mediate the evolution of this, uh, uh, the convergent evolution of this lifestyle in the alkaline. I've been exploiting the model organism potential of one of these free living species that we can keep in the lab. It's this guy here, Dilopia coriaria. It's firmly embedded within this clay poised to evolve this complex kind of symbiosis. It's a, it's a biological control agent. You can buy it by the thousands. Uh, it, like, even though it's predatory, you can feed on low meal. It's got a generation time of 20 days, high fecundity, sexually dimorphic. So it's basically a rogue beetle drosophila. And uh, it embodies this pre-adaptive ground state that's poised to evolve myrmecophily through changes in morphology, behavior, and, and glandular chemistry. So just before I finish, I'm going to mention some of the work I've been doing in this regard, uh, in the, uh, exploring the evolution of enzymatic biosynthesis in allioprines, which is important in mediating their ability to transition to lysozyte ant colonies. So uh, profiling the chemistry of Dilotia's gland, we find it has these quinones, which are the top topical irritants, dissolved in a kind of undecaying solvent. And this is the primitive chemistry of allioprines which is in Mercoffer species has been reprogrammed. Now, uh, we transcriptionally profiled the gland of Dilopia and have had a pretty good idea now of the enzymes that the gland expresses, and also the transcription factors that are involved in the specification of the gland. So we're interested now in exploring how the biosynthesis of the gland compound is controlled enzymatically, and how the transcription of those enzymes is controlled uh, and, uh, uh, within the gland as a foundation to exploring how this uh, uh, circuitry is evolved in the species. We've optimized RNAi in this species, it works really well. I'm just going to show you what to do, what happens when you use systemic RNAi in the <coughs> vital ads, you get a perfect homeopathy transformation of the wing to the uh, elytron. So we're using this technique to systematically knock down the enzymes involved in biosynthesis in the gland. More generally, we've made an isogenic line for this species, it's got a small genome, 290 megabases, uh, we're developing tools for CRISPR and transgenesis to explore other facets of the biology of the species that are relevant to, to Myrmecophily as a foundation for comparative studies of closely related Myrmecophilus species to explore the mechanistic basis for convergent evolution of this lifestyle in this massive thing of people. So I'm just going to acknowledge Monotoshi. This is us trying to gas to death an army ant colony in a hole in a tree, which is a total disaster. <laughs> and, and, uh, and all the people, Tara Eldridge, Steve Davis, and Isaiah Thomas, made an underground Columbia who optimized RNAR um, to help me get those Dilokia projects off the ground. So I'll stop and take any questions. So actually the clades where, it's, it's a little bit of a lie to say that the, the army ant ones have evolved directly from a free living condition. We think that there are many more generalized morphology uh, growth fields associated with army ants, and they form large clades. Uh, and some of the uh, myrmecoid ones have arisen from within those clades. So there's a kind of precursor form of myrmecoid, simpler form, less derived than the, 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 um, uh, the kind of transitional stage during the evolution of this more elaborate kind.